This panel we have tonight has also, at least some of the authors, produced a book that is called The Syria Dilemma. Uh, and as one person put it, besides The Syria Dilemma, we now have a whole new sort of diplomatic register experimenting with The Syria Dilemma. So I think of this panel tonight as something where we want to move to the heart of whatever the matters that concern us, that we struggle about, that we know about. We want to have uh, some good, sharp, pointed questions. There is a lot of knowledge in the room. Make your questions short and sharp. And, um, and really to have a debate. I do not think there are simple answers. We have four very different speakers. And uh, I will introduce them very, very briefly. Do you have, do you have uh, short descriptions in the, um, in the program? So we will start with Nader Hashemi, who is director of the Center for Middle East Studies at the University of Denver's Corbell School of International Studies. He is the author of Islam, Secularism, and Liberal Democracy toward a democratic theory for Muslim societies. Also with Danny Postel, who is the, really the co-organizer uh, of this event with me. Uh, of the people, he's the author of the, um, their editors of The People Reloaded, The Green Movement and the Struggle for Iran's Future, and then also The Syria Dilemma, of course. Second speaker will be Basil Corker, who serves as the U.S. legal advisor to the Washington and United Nations offices of the National Coalition of Syria, Revolution, and Opposition Forces. He advises the coalition on various legal and foreign policy issues, including sanctions compliance, economic development, UN diplomacy, and international negotiations. He has been counseling Syrian opposition groups and humanitarian aid organizations throughout the course of the revolution. Kenneth Roth, uh, very much our here of New York, is the executive director of Human Rights Watch. He has conducted numerous human rights investigations and missions around the world and has written extensively on a wide range of human rights abuses, devoting special attention to international justice, counterterrorism, the foreign policies of the major powers, and the work of the United Nations. He's a frequent contributor to the New York Review of Books, and I love your essays. They are really great, very, um, very profound. One has to think. Um, Michael Walzer will complete the f initial brief presentations and also comment on the prior presentations. He is Professor Emeritus at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton and served as an editor of the journal Descent for more than three decades. That is really stamina. <laughs> Walter's many books include the classic Just and Unjust Wars. Another book is Arguing About War, Spheres of Justice, a book many of us read, had to read, liked to read, The Company of Critics, Thick and Thin Moral Arguments at Home and Abroad, On Toleration, and Politics and Passion. I really enjoyed reading all these titles because in a way they map a zone, you know, within which the, the subject that we address tonight also dwells. And his next book is about the success and failures of national liberation movements. So what I want to ask the speakers is to address key issues from their perspective for about 10 minutes, if that is possible. Uh, and we just uh, go down the... And then uh, we are going to open it to, to questions. There are two mics, so if you can start coming up, uh, then we can sort of move rather dynamically. Again, it's a huge subject. It contains many realities. None of them is clear. All of them have contradictions. There is no easy solution. And in a way, I think of this evening as an experiment in exploring, decoding, and perhaps discovering possibilities from this sort of mix of different intelligences and probably different political positions. Thank you very much. So, yeah. Okay, thank you all for coming tonight. And thank you to uh, Saskia Sassen for organizing this event. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Syria has become the great tragedy of this century, a disgraceful humanitarian calamity with suffering and displacement unparalleled in recent history. Those are not my words. They are the words of Antonio Guterres, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, spoken roughly three months ago. And I concur with his assessment. Syria today represents the largest humanitarian and moral catastrophe of the 21st century. Arguably, Darfur was worse. And I think the facts and the figures speak for themselves. The killing fields of Syria have now surpassed those of Bosnia. Conservative estimates suggest that approximately 100,000 people have been killed during the past two and a half years of conflict, and there is no end in sight. Earlier this month, the United Nations reported that 40% of the estimated 23 million people in Syria are now in need of humanitarian aid. In other words, we're approaching a figure of approximately half the population of Syria. They're now either refugees or internally displaced. The comparative figures here for the U.S. based on a population ratio would be approximately 120 million Americans either turned into refugees or internally, internally displaced. And the U.N. predicts that the refugee figures will double by the end of next year. Diseases, including those easily preventable by basic hygiene and vaccination, are spreading at an alarming rate. A few weeks ago, there were reports of a major polio outbreak in Syria. Commenting on this development, the distinguished Pakistani journalist Ahmed Rashid wrote that this news is, quote, a frightening indictment of the civilized world's utter failure at peacemaking in Syria, that a disease that the World Health Organization and organizations such as Bill Gates Foundation have, in a global campaign, been so close to eliminating has returned with a vengeance in Syria. Just this past week, the Oxford Research Group released a report that revealed that more than 11,000 children have been killed in Syria, including young boys and girls who were tortured and executed. Quote, what is most disturbing about the findings of this report is not only the sheer numbers of children killed in this conflict, but the way that they were killed. More than 1,000 children have been either summarily executed or killed by snipers, the report found. Some 112 children, including infants, were tortured before being killed. And what's worse, the report noted that the deaths of children are mounting in Syria. Summarizing the moral catastrophe that Syria has become, the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has observed, quote, after more than two years, we no longer count days and hours, but in bodies. Another day, another 100, 200, 300 dead. Fighting rages, sectarian hatred is on the rise. The catalog of war crimes is mounting. The rising death toll has also been, uh, this rising death toll has been copiously documented by Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and the UN Special Independent International Commission of Inquiry on Syria. Collectively, they have issued approximately 25 detailed reports all have charged the Assad regime with a policy of state-sanctioned war crimes and crimes against humanity. And the UN High Commissioner for, for Human Rights, Navi Pele, has repeatedly called on the UN Security Council to refer Syria to the International Criminal Court. Quote, we will be judged against the tragedy that has unfolded before our eyes, Pili has stated. And then just today, if you're following the news, Navi Pile issued another statement on Syria that directly pointed the finger at Assad and his inner circle, where according to her, massive evidence exists of very serious war crimes, crimes against humanity, and that evidence indicates responsibility at the highest levels of the Syrian government, including the head of state. End quote. In this same vein, and running on, writing on behalf of the elders, a global network of prominent leaders on human rights, Desmond Tutu has observed, quote, we are all shamed by Syria's suffering. Now the moral case to do something about the human rights catastrophe in Syria is, I think, easy to make. The need to alleviate human suffering, the need to respond to this um, orgy of violence that has been unfolding before our eyes over the past two and a half years. But there's also important political principles at stake in this conflict that has been taking place in Syria that should not be ignored and that I think should guide us in terms of how we respond to this particular crisis. 
These political principles, in my view, have been forgotten, or in some cases, they have been deliberately um, ignored or obfuscated. And I think the key political principle here is really the principle of self-determination and the principle of democracy. Let's recall how this conflict began. It's often forgotten that the Syrian revolution, the uprising, began precisely in the middle of the Arab Spring uprisings in, May, in, in March of 2011 in the context of a broader campaign and desire to rid um, societies, in this case Syria, of authoritarian political tyranny. In the case of Syria, 43 years of one family rule um, sparked a revolt that was, for the first six to eight months, overwhelmingly nonviolent, overwhelmingly nonsectarian, um, and it, um, it, it has largely been forgotten. Those early impulses, those early desires, the early sort of demand for people to live a life of dignity, live a life where they can choose their own political leaders, live a life um, in ways that we sort of take for granted here in the West. Uh, and that struggle for dignity, for democracy, for social justice, uh, those basic political pr principles that are at the heart of, I think, a socially just political order um, should not be forgotten. Uh, and I think we need to uh, be in solidarity with those political principles and those uh, forces on the ground who are defending and fighting for those principles. We can have a debate in terms of what the best strategies should be to um, support the Syrian revolution, to support the Syrian Democrats, to support um, a political transition in Syria so that Syrians can live in a society much better than the last 43 years that has characterized um, Syrian um, politics. Um, those are, I think, legitimate debates, but I think ignoring those political principles and thinking that somehow um, these principles will not, uh, th th these principles can be forgotten and that um, they, are, they are somehow, um, you know, principles that don't matter anymore in terms of how we think about this conflict and think about bringing uh, a political solution to Syria. Um, I think we need to, we need to remember the, the origins of this conflict. It's largely been forgotten, as I said, and I think we do so at our own uh, collective peril. And there's much more that I think um, I would like to say about Syria. Um, um, one of the issues that um, is mentioned in the, in the book that Danny Postel and I edited and that I had the, uh, the chance to comment on is that um, in thinking about how to respond to a particular moral and political crisis and tragedy, we need to uh, listen much more closely to Syrian voices. One of the things that sort of struck me in the debate on Syria here in this country over the last two and a half years is the um, glaring lack of um, Syrian voices uh, in the debate. Uh, Syria has become a political battlefield, in my view, to settle a set of political scores that have nothing to do with Syria. Um, different people are using Syria as a political football to, I think, address um, political grievances that are very legitimate. But I think um, we need to bring it back to Syria. We need to listen to what Syrians are saying, what they're asking from us, uh, what they're demanding from us. And I think if we do that, uh, the way forward will become uh, much more clear. Thank you. Thank you for those remarks, which is, uh, I think, an accurate characterization of, um, of, of, of where we are. Um, and, and thank you all for coming. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, I'll speak a, a little bit uh, practically uh, about where we are now. Um, I had some prepared remarks, but I, I've had a long day of meetings um, today that have sort of uh, turned some of that or changed some of that. Um, and I want to be as up to date as possible because, uh, after all, we want to talk about uh, the solution or potential solutions, at least as much as we talk about the problems. Um, as of now, uh, Plan A is Geneva II, the Geneva Conference. And I guess it more accurately to say uh, Plans A, B, and C are all Geneva II. Uh, the international community has invested heavily um, in that process, uh, in the prospects of a peace or the beginning of a peace being shaped in Geneva. They've set a date. Uh, there's, there was a slew of rumored dates, but now the actual date has been set uh, as Janu beginning on January 22nd. 
and I can discuss a little bit about the modalities <clears throat> that are being negotiated right now um, for the conference. Um, but I think it's important to, um, to, to start uh, with the beginning. Um, as, uh, as Professor Hashimi said, uh, this started in, uh, in March 2011 in the small town of Dara, um, where uh, protests began as part of the Arab Spring movement where people were making uh, demands, uh, uh, by the way, at the beginning, not demands for uh, removal of the regime or replacement of the regime uh, or the government per se, but for economic and political freedoms um, that were sort of uh, the hallmark of many of the protests throughout the Arab Spring. Um, at that point, protests started uh, popping up in various cities in addition to Dada, and, and really that was a turning point. Uh, that was a, a directional point. Uh, and it, I don't want to make it sound haphazard because it was at that point that the government, as the uh, main protector of the people, the institutor of change and reform, uh, had the decision, uh, had a decision to make, which was how would they react um, to these demands. Uh, I don't want to make it sound haphazard because it wasn't a decision made then. I think uh, if you look historically, and I'm, I'm not a historian, um, uh, but if you read through this book and some other uh, writings and serials, you, you might uh, see that the, the decision was, was uh, uh, preconceived years ago, decades ago, not by Bashar al-Assad, but by his father. The way the security apparatus was designed, the way the military apparatus was designed, um, just the focus on uh, internal presence uh, of the military in Syria. Uh, this was how it was going to go. Now I don't want to say it was a foregone conclusion. There was a lot of hope for Bashar Assad as a reformer and as somebody who would react as a reformer rather than a despot. Um, uh, however, uh, he, he did turn out to be the latter. They started firing um, uh, live rounds of ammunition on people protesting. Um, it lasted for months uh, uh, without anyone uh, sort of defending that uh, on the ground. But as certain members of the Syrian military objected to the orders that they were receiving to fire on protesters, uh, some of them uh, of moral conscience and great moral conscience because, um, because they knew they were putting their own lives at risk by doing this, refused the orders and defected. Um, and that was the beginning of people either abandoning the Syrian army or uh, beginning the, uh, the elements of the Free Syrian Army. Now, that's the beginning. Obviously, at that point, it became uh, militarized on a much more uh, rapid and massive scale, outside funding on both sides, massive provision of weaponry and funding from Iran, Hezbollah, uh, Russia on one side, uh, and, and a number of countries on the other, both, uh, on the other side, both politically and in terms of material support. Um, the rest of the history is, is uh, the, the revolution has been quite well documented, uh, <clears throat> and we're happy to obviously discuss it. But let me let me go back to um, uh, who the opposition is now. So now you still have the Free Syrian Army, um, in a sense. Uh, if you're following the developments on, on on the ground on the military side, you see that uh, the, the armed opposition um, to the regime uh, in itself has taken on different forms. Um, the past couple months have actually seen large um, uh, coalitions or, in a recent case, mergers of different armed groups that previously weren't being very coordinated. Um, it's, it's, it's good and it's bad. Uh, certainly the things that some of them have come out and said they stand for are not in line with uh, what the legitimate opposition considers to be the principles of the revolution, um, which, which I'll, I'll describe briefly. Um, and, and that's going to be messy. Um, every day that this continues, the more and more complicated it gets, the more and more difficult it's going to be to unravel through a Geneva process uh, or through any other means. Uh, so the opposition now on the political side and, and who I represent uh, uh, as legal advisor here in the U.S. is the National Coalition of Syrian uh, Revolution and Opposition Forces, Al-Atilaf al watani al um, this uh, organization uh, has been recognized by the international community, over 100 countries of the Friends of the Syrian People, as legitimate representative of the Syrian people. Um, that's, uh, uh, it's also been mentioned in uh, United Nations resolutions as legitimate interlocutor on behalf of, um, interlocutor, sorry, on behalf of the uh, Syrian people in any peace negotiations. 
Uh, they've taken the positions that I think support, that are supported by the people of Syria. They represent the democratic aspirations of the Syrian people. Um, it's going to sound pie in the sky, and we can talk about how messy it is in reality, but I'll list the principles. Um, they support a democratic uh, civil state. Uh, they support the protection and integration of minority rights and no discerning uh, citizenship based on ethnic or religious uh, grounds. Uh, they support um, basic constitutional principles that we're all familiar with, like separation of powers, independent judiciary, uh, the demonopolization of the, uh, of the uh, economy from the hands of the regime and the family members. Um, so, and the list goes on. I, and again, I know these are very, uh, these sound like very broad, uh, you know, fancy principles that are uh, aspirational only, and, and maybe they are. But that's what this opposition stands for. And it's important to note um, as we approach Geneva, that this, these are the principles that this opposition accepts. It doesn't mean this is what will be implemented, that they can get international agreement on putting these things in place in Syria. That was the hope at the beginning. Um, but at this point, um, for these reasons, you know, they're referred to as the moderate opposition, the mainstream opposition. This is the group that would form the heart and lead, uh, as the uh, uh, Friends of Syria have put it, of the delegation to Geneva II, although it would include other um, opposition figures. Um, the reason being that they represent, again, the moderate, the mainstream uh, principles of the revolution, and they're connected to the, uh, many of the armed brigades on the ground, uh, therefore are uh, effective at, potentially effective at implementing any agreement that comes out of Geneva, um, which is an important part of it. So what is Geneva? Um, the, the basic essence of the Geneva One, um, the Geneva Communique from 2012, uh, as far as the opposition is concerned, a key clause would be uh, the international community coming together and agreeing that the Syrian, there should be a Syrian-led transition and that it should result in a, a full transfer of executive authority, full executive authority to a transitional governing body, that authority to include the full presidential powers of military and security sectors. Um, that's important because as long as the, uh, the, the military and security sectors are centered uh, in a government institution. As far as the opposition is concerned, there can't be any legitimate elections or successor or opening up of the country uh, democratically. So, so that's the key term, and that's, a, that's the term that the international community has focused on recently, too. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, the, the core group of 11 of the Friends of the Syrian People issued a communique in which they uh, made that language the focal point of their, uh, of their communique, which was an interpretation of the Geneva I leading up to Geneva II. The opposition itself, uh, meetings uh, in Istanbul the past couple weeks, uh, two weeks ago, uh, endorsed that position. They have agreed to attend Geneva II, uh, which, was, which was not a foregone conclusion, um, but they understood the pressure and the reasons for doing it. Is it realistic? I don't know. I don't know that any of us um, can know. I think it's easy to say no. Um, but the more accurate question probably is what could come of, of the Geneva negotiations? And there's a range of possibilities. Um, not all of them good, um, even if they sound good diplomatically. For instance, uh, if, they, if they go, as far as the opposition is concerned, if they go to Geneva too and they come out of it with anything less than this transitional governing body with full executive authorities, um, it may be considered a diplomatic step forward, but on the ground they're dealing with an armed uh, opposition that is digging in its heels uh, and growing further and further difficult to bring on board of a with a political process. Uh, so even if they do make some progress in Geneva, it's not, uh, uh, doesn't necessarily follow that that would be implemented or accepted broadly, even within the opposition on the ground. Um, so what's needed, what's needed is, is a, a support of the international community. And I mean that not only in verbal support, but everything that the international community has been doing uh, would need to be coordinated in the, week of, in the wake of Geneva II uh, to accord with the implementation of Geneva II. That's very important because whenever you see, you hear a lot about the disunified opposition and the disparate opposition and the different sources and the different interests and the different strategies, if you see that, that's a reflection of the exact same phenomena happening in the supporters of the opposition. What the disunity that you see in the Syrian opposition is a direct result of disunity by the international community. In fact, there hasn't been an instance really when the international community has been able to agree on anything with regard to Syria. From the Russian and China vetoes at the Security Council, 
um, to disparate approaches even within the Friends of Syria, to massive blocks of countries that, ab that uh, abstain from even partaking in the, in the issue when it's on the floor of the uh, General Assembly of the United Nations. Um, even within the core group of the Friends of the Syrian People who actively support the, the revolution, there hasn't been a, a one unified strategy. Uh, so yes, th there have been times when the opposition, um, it's been peaks and valleys and it's never been completely unified, but the disunity um, is, is not a, so much a cause <clears throat> alone as it is a result of, of uh, international disunity. Uh, I'll wrap up quickly because I think we can um, get into more specifics with question, with, uh, in the question session, but there's one missing uh, answer. There's one question that hasn't been answered um, from our perspective leading into Geneva II. Geneva II calls for a transitional government with full executive authorities uh, to be selected by mutual consent of the parties, which means that uh, Bashar al-Assad and his uh, regime and anybody with blood on their hands would not be acceptable, would not be part of the transition. That's by operation of the mutual consent clause in the Geneva Agreement, reiterated in the London communique. That being the case, the opposition has uh, 100 reasons to want to go to Geneva. The actual implementation of the Geneva, if it were to happen, and that's, again, very aspirational at this point, if it were to happen in lines with the Geneva communique, results in a transition to democracy that sets the stage for elections uh, and reform and the very long and difficult and expensive and tumultuous process of reconciliation, reconstruction, democratization won't be easy at all. Um, it'll be a long-term and messy process. It can't get started until, until they have an agreement. The missing question then is, why would the regime go? Why would the Assad regime go? The premise is they feel that they can win militarily, meaning they can defend enough land and territory to be considered the sovereign of Syria or parts of Syria, uh, and that they haven't had an th internal threat strong enough or powerful enough to really threaten their standing as such, um, especially centrally and on some areas in the coast. So if they believe they can win or maintain militarily without giving anything up, um, other than parts of the country that have now been destroyed and are rampant with um, disparate opposition groups and in many cases, terrorist groups, then why would the regime go to Geneva under those uh, conditions? The answer has to be that there's pressure. There has to be pressure coming on the regime to go and engage in this peace process. The pressure has to come either from the supporters of the regime, like Russia, um, and to that extent, it falls on the opposition a little bit to make the case to Russia and to the international community that hasn't supported it, that these are the principles we stand for and the partnerships we stand for and that we can work together. Or the pressure has to come from the opponents of the regime. Uh, the US, the Friends of Syria, France, Britain, the Arab League, uh, where they come in and say that if Geneva doesn't succeed in this transition, then we will consider a much stronger intervention to force that transition. So if the pressure comes from one of those places, I could see an answer to why would the regime legitimately go under those conditions to Geneva. If that question isn't answered, and by the way, it doesn't have to be answered publicly. I don't want to need to know the answer. I don't think we all need to know the answer before Geneva. The time before Geneva is going to be a period of public diplomacy, or some people would say posturing, um, before the negotiations. So we don't, I don't need the answer spelled out. But we do need to know that behind the scenes there is an answer, that there's pressure on the regime to engage in this transition so they can move on and begin the process that the entire international community has endorsed of transition to a democratic state. Um, last quick point, uh, I mentioned briefly the terrorist groups. This is a real and growing risk. Um, the coalition, uh, again, another reason that they're a mainstream moderate uh, uh, opposition is that they've rejected the influence of the terrorist groups on the ground. That being specifically the Al-Qaeda-linked groups, the Nusra Front, uh, Daesh or uh, ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Sham, to the extent it still technically exists, um, and its followers who commit terrorist acts, um, certainly what they stand for doesn't gel with what the opposition stands for. Um, there's no extremist opposition. There's opposition and there's extremists. The opposition doesn't recognize those terrorist groups and those terrorist groups don't recognize the opposition. So in a lot of times in the public discourse they get they sort of combined and say, well, there's a terrorist opposition that Assad is fighting. It's not true. 
The terrorists in Syria have actually turned against the um, opposition in many instances. And in some cases, you find that there are very little, few, suspiciously few skirmishes between terrorists and the regime, and more so terrorists turning against the moderate opposition leaders to try and wrest control uh, of, of areas. So, so that's the point. Um, um, as that grows, as Geneva drags out, and if a resolution is re reached in Geneva, fighting that growing terrorist threat is going to be more and more difficult. It's more and more dangerous to the international community, especially to Syrians, um, and, it's, and it's something we absolutely don't want. So um, I'll end there, and uh, thank, you. thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for your interest in Syria. Um, I think the most important thing to understand about the war in Syria is that the Assad government is fighting not simply the combatants on the other side but a major part of its war strategy is to attack civilians, um, civilians who happen to be living in opposition-held areas. Um, and there's a, a very clear rationale for doing this. It's, in a sense, the, the classic counterinsurgency strategy of draining the sea to get the fish. If you can make life miserable enough for the civilians who live in the areas that the rebels control, um, if you can kill enough of them, and make the conditions of living difficult enough for those who remain, a large number of them will flee. And um, there are military advantages to that flight because um, rebels will have a harder time hiding among the civilian population. Um, rebels will have a harder time purchasing their supplies from a functioning economy if um, the people who maintain that economy have had to leave. So there is a, a logic to it. It is a logic of war criminals, because this strategy is strictly prohibited by the Geneva Conventions, which Syria and everybody else has ratified. But it is the logic that is driving the Assad government today. And when you consider the conflict, I think you have to consider that foremost. Um, roughly 40% of the you know, 115,000 Syrians who have lost their lives directly um, to, to the violence are civilians. Um, obviously, a lot of combatants are dying, um, and you can say every human right, every, every human life is sacred, but there is a difference under international law between shooting at the combatants on the other side and shooting at the civilians who happen to live where um, the other side's combatants have seized the territory. And so what the Assad government has done is, you know, use a variety of means to attack the civilian population. The, the most notorious case was August 21st, the chemical weapon attack on Ghouta, the, the suburb of Damascus, where um, you know, well over 1,000 civilians died in one night. Um, that was an unusual night. But you know, typically, 2,000 or so, 2,500 civilians have been dying every month. So there is a, you know, a deadly drumbeat to these attacks. Um, the civilians killed on August 21st were, you know, less than, fewer than 2% of the Syrian deaths in the course of the conflict. So while there's been a lot of focus on the chemical weapons, and while it's certainly good that we seem to have an accord to get rid of them um, because they can kill a lot of people fast, we shouldn't be complacent because it is mainly conventional weapons that are killing people. Um, and those conventional weapons have been very systematically directed um, at schools, at bakeries, at the bread lines of civilians lining up at the bakeries, at medical clinics, at hospitals. Um, my, my wife who's here, and Dr. Annie Sparrow, has actually written about the attacks on the medical system, which are frankly without precedent in modern warfare. I have never seen another conflict in which the medical system has so been so, been, so deliberately and systematically attacked as what we've seen um, at the hands of the Syrian government. Um, it's not just the, uh, the attacks with weapons, though. Another strategy has been basically to deprive the civilian population in rebel-held areas of their basic necessities. So um, some areas are completely besieged, and no food or medicine is able to get in, nor are people able to get out. 
Um, other areas, people have simply been displaced. Um, you know, over two million are now formerly refugees, and in some respects, they're the lucky ones because they're outside of the immediate killing range of Assad. But um, you know, within the country, there are some six and a half million who are displaced. Um, a large percentage of those, maybe half, are in need of humanitarian assistance. And the Syrian government has done everything it can to make sure that those who are still in opposition-held area have a hard time getting that humanitarian assistance. And they've used a variety of techniques that don't necessarily involve shooting at anybody. But it's simply a matter of you know, preventing um, willing humanitarian contributors from the international community from gaining access to these people. So there are delays in, in visas being given to humanitarian workers. There are delays in the customs clearances required for humanitarian aid to come in. Um, perhaps most important, all of the aid has to be delivered to government-held areas, typically Damascus. Occasionally, they allow aid to go elsewhere. But they don't allow aid to go directly to the opposition-held areas. So for example, the vast swaths of northern Syria, which are controlled by the opposition, um, the easiest way to service those areas with humanitarian assistance would be across the border from Turkey. That's not allowed. Um, there are, is some informal delivery of aid that's going on, but the UN, um, the, the operation, the OCHA, the UN Humanitarian Agency, um, the rules it follows is that it will not cross a border without the government's permission, and the government is not giving that permission. So all the aid is coming through government areas with huge delays and the consequence that much of it never gets to the people in most acute need because they are the ones who live in opposition-held areas. And that's the point. Um, then they're forced to flee, and it's, it's easier for the government to pursue the, the, the rebels. Now, I don't want to um, pretend that everything's wonderful on the other side. We, we've, we've heard a fairly positive account of the opposition. I have to say, Basel, I don't agree with your statement that there are no extremists among the opposition. I mean, unless we play definitional games. But you know, there are some members who are certainly some of the time fighting Assad. Um, and I take your point that, that it is convenient for the Syrian government to allow the extremists to flourish and the more secular opposition to be attacked because it wants to portray all of the opposition as a bunch of you know, Islamic terrorists, and, and therefore you should come and back Assad. That said, um, we have to recognize that the opposition does have a large number of, of people, whether under the guise of al-Nusra or ISIS, um, who are not nice people, who don't believe in the great principles that, that Basel articulated, and who themselves are committing atrocities who are massacring people, who are um, you know, highly sectarian, who do not believe in the minority rights you articulated. Let's not sugarcoat this. Um, and that, that extremist element is gaining in ascendancy for some of the reasons that, that Basel outlined. Um, the fact that you know, the West is not in any significant way supporting the opposition. Um, there are parties like Qatar and the Saudis who are uh, less discriminating in terms of who they support. And so the, the extremists tend to have more weapons available to them. And if you are an opposition fighter and want to survive, you are naturally drawn to the extremists because they are better able to fight. Um, so we have real problems on the opposition side. And indeed, that is a lot of why it's become almost a, you know, a self-reinforcing cycle. Um, the West has been reluctant to help. The opposition becomes more extremist. The West becomes more reluctant to help. Um, that's the cycle that we're in right now. Um, that said, I don't want to pretend that opposition abuses are anywhere near the dominant problem in Syria. The dominant problem is by far and away the atrocities being committed by the Syrian government. Now, what might be done about this? You know, obviously, you want to put pressure on Assad um, to fight the war legitimately, by which I mean shoot at the combatants not at the civilians who happen to be in opposition territory. Um, much of the pressure that remains to be put, the pressure beyond the, the Western-only sanctions that have always already been imposed, much of the additional pressure would require action by the UN Security Council. And as we all know, Russia, seconded by China, has been vetoing or threatening to veto any escalation of sanctions by the Security Council. So, there are no economic sanctions that have been imposed. There's no arms embargo that has been imposed. There's no reference of Syria to the International Criminal Court 
so that the threat of prosecution can be used as a deterrent. Indeed, the Security Council has not even condemned Assad. Russia won't let them do that. The only thing that the Security Council has been willing to do so far is the resolution um, that basically ratified the chemical deal that was agreed to under threat of US military strikes. And then five days later, there was something short of resolution, what's known as a presidential statement um, that the Security Council issued unanimously, all 15 members, but still something short of a resolution, which basically um, ordered Assad to allow humanitarian aid um, into you know, all parts of Syria. Um, and it is, that presidential statement is now um, very modestly, very reluctantly, very incrementally, but for the most part not at all being implemented. Um, now, the US engagement so far um, I think is worth reviewing. Uh, we know the, the recent history. We know that you know, Obama, whether it was scripted or not, blurted out that the use of chemical weapons would be a red line. Um, when, when chemical weapons were used on a large scale, he was forced to act, um, partly as a matter of his and US credibility, partly I think also because you know, since we were talking about weapons of mass destruction and because the, the dominant US interest in the Middle East at the moment is preventing Iran from acquiring a different weapon of mass destruction, nuclear weapons, um, it was very important to enforce that red line. And given the importance of, of attached to this in Washington, um, there was success. And um, the chemical deal seems so far to be reasonably implemented. You know, undoubtedly Assad is hoarding a little bit here and there, but it would be extraordinarily difficult for another large-scale chemical attack to place, take place. But the main U.S. effort now, um, you know, as, as has been mentioned, is to make Geneva II work. Um, this is primarily an effort of diplomacy. Um, it is designed to bring in a transitional government that if it would ever be agreed to by all sides would be government without Assad. Um, in the context of Geneva II, the US is pushing Syria to make some modest, you know, good faith gestures, take a few steps, um, you know, perhaps release a few political prisoners, perhaps ease up on the constraints on humanitarian access. But there's been very little serious pressure on Assad. And indeed, Geneva too has become a bit of a trap. Um, and I, I say this by no means trying to minimize the importance of peace. If peace could break out tomorrow, that'd be great. But I think we have to recognize that the prospects of Geneva too working ever are remote. And certainly, even in I think the best case realistic scenario, Geneva II is going to take a long, long time to bear fruition. And in the interim, Syrians are being killed at 5,000 a month. So for me, the question is, you know, by all means, push the peace process. But what are you going to be doing in the interim to stop the killing? And the answer, unfortunately, is very little. In fact, the US is not, at this point, even pushing the Security Council to adopt a binding resolution on humanitarian aid because that's deemed you know, too disruptive of Geneva II. So Syria is able to say, well, the presidential statement issued by the Security Council is not binding, so we really are not legally obliged to let humanitarian aid go anyplace. There's a simple answer to that, adopt a resolution, but that would mean pushing Russia to allow it and the US is not willing to engage in anything so disruptive, potentially, to Geneva too. Um, this is partly a product also of the fact that the US um, is very much held hostage by Russia because today it needs Russia to ensure the implementation of the chemical deal. And so while the chemical deal was great, we have to recognize that there's a cost to it because um, Obama is so desperate not to have the chemical deal fall apart not to have to have the military option put back on the table, that he's not going to do anything to upset Russia to the point where it may stop pressuring Assad to comply with the chemical deal. Um, and needless to say, no pressure is being put on anybody to stop killing civilians. Um, the, the great advantage of Geneva II 
is that you know, John Kerry can be a hero by engaging in diplomacy, but nobody talks about the place where he's not a hero at all, which is on the battlefields of Syria, where people are being killed left and right, and no one is paying attention in the short term other than this very, very long, long-term strategy of having a peace deal. So you know, that's where we are. Um, it doesn't have to be this way. Um, there are ways that would make a, you know, steps that could be taken that would make a big difference to curtail the killing. Most of it involves putting pressure on Russia or putting pressure on Iran to in turn put pressure on Assad. You know, Assad is a very vulnerable individual. He has two allies in the world. Um, each of them has their own vulnerabilities, but for various reasons, the U.S. now finds itself in a peacemaking mode with Russia and Iran and doesn't want to risk that, even if the cost of that conservatism is many thousands more Syrian dead. So, you know, by all means, let's hope that Geneva II works, but let's recognize it's not going to work soon, and let's push our government and the other governments with influence to address the things that are killing Syrians today, the inability to gain access to aid, and the fact that Assad's weapons are deliberately targeting them. Thank you. Well, I was, I was asked to um, be a commentator on the first three talks. I, I don't actually disagree with anything that was said, so I'm not sure I'll be a very useful commentator. I do think that the hardest question has not been addressed sufficiently directly and forcefully by any of the speakers, and that is, what should the United States do right now? Um, Ken Roth had suggestions in that direction, both tonight and in his, an excellent article in the New York Review of Books uh, some weeks ago. And he points out that um, the Russians have real leverage over the Assad regime. And he thinks that we have, I hope he's right, leverage over the Russians. Um, and that might be a way of pushing the Russians to push Assad uh, toward some kind of, um, I don't know what, ceasefire, some willingness to allow humanitarian aid into the country or something. But while the Russians, but the Russians have leverage over Assad because they have been actively involved in supporting Assad militarily. Um, and we have no leverage over Assad because we have not been involved in supporting the rebels. And we also have no leverage over the rebels because we've not been involved in supporting any faction uh, among them. So even if we could pressure the Russians to pressure Assad to send someone to the table with plausible negotiating positions, it's not at all clear that we could deliver people on the other side of the table, a coherent group of people controlling most of the fighters on the ground who would also have plausible negotiating positions. So the, the, um, the dilemma that we face is really a dilemma about the use of force in these kinds of situations. And I want to just say a few words about, about that, not so much as commentary, but uh, on my own. Um, most of the, of the left, which is where I live, um, has had only one object with regard to Syria today, and that is to keep the U.S. out. Um, and in a kind of alliance, not a negotiated alliance, but a de facto alliance with the libertarian and the neo-isolationist right, it has by and large succeeded. Um, the United States has 
stayed out. Um, and the argument against U.S. intervention was a very strong argument. I made it myself. Um, the argument against U.S. intervention, there hasn't been a comparable argument on the left against Russian, Iranian, or Hezbollah intervention. The argument against U.S. intervention is one word, Iraq. The U.S. war in Iraq had a terrible human cost which must not be repeated. And that was the reiterated argument again and again of most of the people on the left opposed to any intervention in Syria. Well, they succeeded. The US stayed out. And the human cost in Syria has been even higher than it was in Iraq. We're not responsible or at least we're not directly responsible. Um, it happened without our intervention. So the, the situation now is that we're not there in any significant way. And the humanitarian disaster is exactly as it was described to you by each of the, of the other speakers. So now we favor a negotiated settlement, as with the um, poison gas crisis. But that negotiated settlement was made possible by our credible threat, well, at least barely credible, but credible threat to use force. And it was only our threat to use force that produced the negotiated settlement, which is now in progress of eliminating Syria's poison gas, um, all of its poison gas weapons. In the absence of, of, of any US military engagement, what can we do to foster serious negotiations on, over the larger spectrum of um, issues. As I said, the Russians can deliver the Assad regime, but we cannot deliver the rebels. There, there's something that, that needs to be focused on here. It's the, it's the politics of pretending, so that, so that people who, who opposed the uh, sanctions against Iran, and who certainly opposed any threat to use force against Iran, now celebrate the current Iranian negotiations, which are only taking place because of the severity of the sanctions and the maybe barely credible uh, threat uh, to use force. So we have to ask now, are we ready to think about uh, these, uh, these, these facts about modern diplomacy and international politics today? If you want a negotiated settlement, you have to be prepared to use or to threaten to use, credibly to threaten to use force. If you're not willing to do that, you're not going to, you're not going to get a negotiated solution. But is there any, is there among many, most American leftists or libertarian rightists, any real concern about what happens in, in Syria? Aren't we, isn't the truth about the American situation today is that we're drifting up towards some kind of neo-isolationist position according to which so long as the United States isn't directly responsible for what happens, we really don't care what happens. So I mean, the whole argument of this panel so far has been that we should care. And if we care, we have to at least think about, we have to be prepared to think about how to use force effectively. 
Thank you. Um, since uh, we have actually an interesting set of views here, before opening it up to the audience, I would like to ask a question, and I want to start with you, Michael, perhaps not surprisingly, and combine it with something that, um, that Ken said. Uh, there is a logic, there is a stark logic to your argument, there is no doubt. But it is also the kind of argument of which we are perhaps captives. Ken said, protecting civilian populations and Syria, as you also said, is an extreme case because the way you put it, and I sort of agree with that, the aim is destroying the civilian population. Now that presents us with such a clear situation because it's not always as clear as that, this purposeful killing and destroying the civilian space. That sort of suggests to me, now I am a bit of an idealist perhaps and not very practical, I certainly don't, don't engage in practical politics, but shouldn't we develop norms and capacities and somehow agreements, you know, sort of the full range that have to do with actually civilian populations? Not with the tyrant, not with the war, etc., but that starts with civilian populations. So I have this, this sort of little thingy that I'm working on, which is the notion of the right to civilian territory, that a whole city should be that. You know, creating, uh, if you want, uh, a system that you're not trying to just use force to destroy the, the whatever the oppressor, but yet you actually start at ground level, so to say, with where are civilians and protect that. And I think we have arrived at a point of such interdependence in the world. We need each other in such weird ways, but we need each other. I mean, each other, I mean countries and oppressors and power and all of that. That, that in a way, I think there is room now. There is conceptual room, there is political room, there is practical room to begin to alter the terms of the game. Because your analysis is very clear and forceful, but it is really the notion that only with force. And the force goes against the oppressor rather than to protect the civilian. So I just want to launch that as a, as a I couldn't resist. I know, I know that I probably shouldn't have gone so on so long, but, but perhaps I would just love to get some response from yeah, whoever. Um, well, f f first of all, we have very strong international conventions and, and international law very clearly uh, prohibits deliberate attacks on the civilian population. What the Assad regime is doing is, is criminal already. Um, now, it, it would be an interesting um, suggestion to try to create um, zones of of non-killing or zones in which civilians cannot be attacked or whole cities um, declared to be um, immune from attack. I, 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 no one could be against that. I would only point out that those zones would have to be defended. Well, yes, okay, fine. But I, I, maybe you have something to add to that? I mean, I'm thinking of an evolving set of logics rather than our current logic, where that is indeed where you wind up with. Okay, they have to be defended, and so you militarize <laughs> the yeah. situation. Well, I mean, I think one of the problems with creating sort of safe areas, apart from the fact that they have to be defended, and we yeah. we've, have a poor history of doing that, if you think about Srebrenica and the like. Um, but, but also, if the suggestion is that you know, you're safe if you're in this zone, but therefore it's fair game to attack civilians outside the zone, that's not a message you want to send either. Sure. Um, so, I mean, I, I do, you know, coming back to a point Michael made, I mean, I, I personally don't think that there should be much of a distinction between U.S. responsibility by commission versus omission in a context where the U.S. has the capacity to make a difference, but is just choosing not to act. And so, you know, I understand that it, it, you know, the U.S. looks much more responsible for Iraq because of the commission, but I, it deserves a lot of the blame for the killing in Syria because of its failure, its omission. Um, the, 
you know, I, I probably shouldn't apply your theory, Michael, but you know, this is an interesting situation where, where you can look at just war theory. And, and I, you know, one place where I differ from the sort of, you know, classic anti-imperialist left, which places them, the, you know, the premium on never using military force, or certainly never having the U.S. use military force, is that, you know, I do think that there are things worse than war um, and things worse than a U.S. military action. And, and among them, what I, I would include, perhaps all of it I would include, is the mass slaughter of civilians. And I do think that it is sometimes worth fighting to prevent the mass slaughter of civilians. So if you use you know, the language of humanitarian intervention or responsibility to protect, the, the initial threshold, which is to say, you know, is this an, a magnitude of crime serious enough that it would in principle warrant military intervention? The answer has to be yes here. But you then have to get to the other conditions. And you know, the most difficult condition, because frankly at Human Rights Watch we've had this debate, the most difficult condition is, you know, can you reasonably anticipate doing more good than harm by intervening? And this is where you know, I think well-intentioned people differ. Um, you know, the, the argument for intervening is that you know, Assad's military isn't that formidable, um, you know, it, it, even if you stop, you know, 80% of the slaughter of civilians, that's a whole lot. Um, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's not that hard to make the case for action, but the, the case for inaction is that, you know, how do we know this won't become another Iraq? There's already so much sectarian strife in the region. You know, this will just add anti-imperialism to the mix. You know, we've already seen how it's very difficult to control military intervention once it starts. Even if it's done smarter than Bush did, it's a huge risk. And, and given you know, those legitimate concerns, people have been reluctant to say, okay, you know, I think on balance, military intervention is still worth it. Um, and, and that's where you know, a lot of people who ordinarily would contemplate, say, military intervention to stop the Rwandan genocide or to stop the Bosnian genocide um, have a harder time with Syria because of you know, the fear of the consequences. And, and it's only gotten worse as al-Nusra and ISIS have gained ascendancy among the rebels. Because you then have the factor of, you know, well, it's not just a matter of, you know, can we stop Assad from killing civilians, but what if that contributes to the toppling of Assad, and who's going to take over today? You know, it's not going to be the nice Democrats who are all for minority rights. It's going to be, you know, these extremists. And, and so that has made the balance even worse. So even you know, the, the moment when the case was strongest, when, when inaction would mean a green light to Assad to use chemical weapons every single night, and I think that was by far and away the strongest moment for military intervention, um, you know, the chemical weapons have been neutralized, the threat of an Islamist takeover has grown, and, and as a result, military intervention looks less and less like a realistic option. Yeah, um, just, to, just to pick up on the, the, the point that you made about you know, putting civilians at the center of our moral and political thinking. I think it's a, a wonderful idea, but I don't think we can do that um, if we don't listen to the actual voices of those civilians that we're claiming to protect, because there's a sense of paternalism and arrogance that we know what's better for you, we will come and protect you. But unless we bring actually those civilians into the conversation and listen to their voices in terms of what they need from us, then there are deep, deeper problems that flow from, from your suggestion. So in the context of Syria, all the reporting that we have in terms of what the civilians are asking for is military intervention. Not boots on the ground, but a Libya-style type of no-fly zone and military aid to the you know, moderate opposition can stop these atrocities from happening. So we have to, right. I like the idea of listening to, uh, protecting civilians, putting them at the center, yeah. but we also have to listen to them as well. Yeah, but we, now we are in that situation, exactly that, that the civilians are pleading because it's savage. But I think that in some level, Syria is an extreme case of violence, precisely because it is so directed to the civilians. But we have actually evolved. I think that it would be very difficult for a military force today to just launch an atomic bomb on Hiroshima or Dresden fire. It just, you know, there is a kind of a Lilliputian, very weak interweaving of weak regimes that is stopping certain uh, things. And I think it will take 
evolving our logics. We have actually moved, you know, from the barbarians. I don't know that they were that barbarian compared to what we're seeing in Syria now, but anyhow. And, and why not think in those terms? And the final point is no formal system of power has lasted forever. And usually it is not a superior force that brought it down. It brought itself down. It abused its own power. And so when I look at a long historical frame, that is one of the things I was looking at in that book. <laughs> uh, I see that there is a way in which powerlessness can actually become complex. And it is not the superior military force that winds up. The military dictatorship in Latin America, they brought themselves down. It was not another force, really. It was, or it was that weaving of people, etc. But anyhow, I really should stop talking now. So uh, did you want to make a final comment? Because then I wanted to open it up to the audience for questions. Um, no, uh, briefly, you, you though, don't have to. It's just well, I'll, I'll just say quickly on the use of force, because I think it's something we all accept um, without, uh, oh, we've, we've said it somewhat, but even as justified as it may be in Syria, it, it's not a silver bullet. It doesn't solve the problem. I think that was an argument that was made, and it's a legitimate one. Um, you still need a transition. Uh, you still need agreements among the parties that are fighting. You still need a reconciliation plan. You still need economic redevelopment. In fact, one of the, one of the questions, uh, uh, that Ken mentioned was who takes over, and that was a concern that the U.S. had even when talking about the chemical weapon strikes, as if those did go enough to topple the regime, who would then take control? Uh, you're right to, to, to we would say we shouldn't presume it would be the moderate opposition if they hadn't been supported and prepared to take that step. You still need a plan for governance, you need a plan for continuity, you need to keep the lights on. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, use of force is not even necessarily the end of the violence uh, in a place like Syria. If you, even if you do get the transition in place, you still have rogue groups that would be fighting. You still have terrorists that aren't going to abide by any agreement. Uh, you still have vengeance attacks that are a, a, a probably a tragic reality that the international community is going to have to try and contain. Uh, because of the, the sectarian tensions that are starting to bubble up. And then you have crime sprees. I mean, the, the, the currently a lot of the activity that's happening, and I don't want to, I want to step back, I don't want to make it sound like uh, um, that the, the armed opposition or even the moderate opposition has clean hands in this. Absolutely not. Um, uh, folks like Jabhat the Nusra and ISIS, there's a clear line there. They're all related, affiliated with Al Qaeda. Uh, they're not affiliated with the opposition. They don't have the goals of the opposition in mind. That's one thing. But at the same time, even the moderate brigades, some of them do take extremist positions that the, uh, the moderates and the secular and the most people in the U.S. and in Syria are not comfortable with. Um, there's still a crime spree that's happening because of the general lack of any kind of um, stability or, or governance in some areas. Um, I, let's be honest, some Free Syrian Army brigades um, are just corrupt. Um, there are some that steal, there are some that ship things across the borders and sell them uh, at reduced uh, rates. There are some that control oil fields. Uh, there's some that make money by kidnapping and theft. Um, so I, I don't mean to say that there isn't any of that going on. Um, but, but these are questions that even if you do go in and use force, um, you still have to be prepared to answer and to answer robustly. So um, while some of you come and ask, stand by the microphones, I just want to make two announcements. One of them is that tomorrow, um, there is an event right here, starting at 10, on constitutions and cultural pluralism. And I think Nasher Hazemi and Danny Postel are involved in this, right? I think some of the speakers. I also wanted to mention a project that we have going on memory, memory and history, memory and loss, memory and information. And we have a workshop on December the 6th, and I think there are programs that have been distributed. That is part of the Committee on Global Thought uh, program, and Carol Gluck has organized it. So, yes. Oh, it, it, so it, we're going to take... <laughs> I'm not sure who said it. I couldn't see. But at one point, someone said, um, uh, one of the things that keeps the regime going is its belief that it can prevail. Now, there's a converse to that, uh, or some related proposition, namely that it can't afford to fall because the main players in that regime only have to look at Pinochet being arrested in, Lit in London when he went there for an ophthalmology exam or, uh, you know, run it down. Lots of people, uh, Henry Kissinger fleeing from Paris. If there's post-war prosecutions or threat of prosecutions, these guys are, are lost. And who's going to negotiate a plea bargain with them? Yeah. No one can. No one has that power in the international system. So 
they sitting there can say, we can't afford to lose, therefore we just have to keep going. We may not prevail, but we can't afford to lose. It's permanent war. And that's what you're all worried about. That's, it's essentially that's a, that's a good, that's permanent an war. Question. Second thing is that, no, and then I'll stop. No one has mentioned the role of Saudi Arabia in Keta and where those arms <clears throat> and resources are going to and where they, what role they play in resolving this kind of a thing. Thank you. We are going to take several questions and then we can, yes. So do remember the questions, please. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to make a brief comment. Um, what you said, Mr. Basil, at the end, um, you were talking about the continuation of violence even after assuming military intervention did happen. Um, is partition and massive population transfers part of that solution? Is that even considered? And if not, why not? Why, why is there a taboo against partition? If, if the, given the ethnic dimensions of the conflict, shouldn't that be considered? Thank you. Well, sometimes in human events, what didn't happen it can be as instructive as what did. And one major thing did not happen in the Middle East, a country called Morocco. It's been spared all of this chaos. Should we send King Mohammed to Damascus to give a seminar on good government? Uh, a second thing, if you want to get the Russians to change their view, you have to understand their position. Why does Putin think it's more in his interest to support this despot than to maintain good relations uh, with the United States? And third, a more facetious point, do you think Syria and Lebanon would be worse off if the French came back? Or that Somalia and Libya would be worse off if the Italian, I think I made the let's point. Let's keep it, that's right, let's keep it, at the, yeah, thanks. Thanks for this timely conference. Um, do you think beyond the US and the West um, taking responsibility for Syria, um, the responsibility should fall on others, especially Iran. Uh, Russian ambassador to the UN, Cherkin, recently said that whether Iran is in the room or not, is going to be a player in Syria. UN Secretary Ban Ki-moon, um, former Secretary Kofi Annan, all have supported Iran being in negotiations. And <clears throat> on Iran's side, Javad Zarif, Iran's foreign minister, said that if Iran is invited, um, they will participate without any preconditions. So do you think Iran should be included in talks, for instance, out of re moral responsibility on the US to engage Iran about Syria? And would the Geneva Conference work without them? Are you writing a paper about this? <laughs> You had it all mapped out there. Yes. Hi. Um, there's been a reported, uh, I think, two million refugees, um, half of which are in Jordan, um, half of which are children. Um, at what point does that totally drain all the resources of all the neighboring states around mm -hmm. Syria? And uh, what, what do we do about it then? Like, would they put pressure, mm -hmm. a certain type of pressure? That or comes... like economic pressure, right, resource right. pressure, sure. human capital? OK, why don't we stop now? And shall we have a first sort of set of answers, and then? You can, who wants to start? Oh, yeah. Um, OK. Uh, uh, with regard to the regional countries that have been involved in arming uh, the opposition, uh, uh, I mean, in the very beginning, uh, in the US administration, the Obama administration, there was a, a plan proposed to, uh, uh, I believe, according to reports, to uh, manage the militarization, so to speak, to arm the rebels, or at least to direct where the arms from these countries were going. Um, uh, as far as I know, um, and that's, a, again, it's a covert program, so we don't know, but that wasn't acted on um, in, 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 in a significant way. Um, so there, there is not a lot of coordination, and if I may you know, even go further, that there's actually rivalries, uh, and it's in some, some cases competition in the arming process, and it has led to just a disaster on the ground. Um, the arming hasn't been coordinated. Um, obviously, it hasn't been effective enough to achieve the objectives. Um, now, as far as wh where those countries go next, uh, if the, they've all signed up for the Geneva process, if that's the process that, that happens, and if there's going to be anything that comes out of it, whether it's a transitional governing body or something much more interim and much smaller, you need the buy-in. You need the buy-in from the international community. You need to have <clears throat> Saudi Arabia and Qatar on, and you need to have Iran and Russia to some extent um, uh, complying too. Now, Iran specifically at uh, the negotiations, different modalities are still being negotiated as to who would be present. Um, Iran's role in Syria is worth noting is, is different than other countries. They have 
uh, troops on the ground, training and fighting. They have Hezbollah activated in the thousands, on the ground, training, fighting, providing equipment, providing support. Providing, so, so they're not a legitimate mediator. Now, can they be consulted? Um, that, that's a modality, I, I, that's, that's a detail I think that, that can be worked out and about the, the, the way the Geneva negotiations are being set up and anything could change, but um, it's envisioned that the first day would be the only day that there would be actual physical presence from um, countries uh, other than Syrians and that after that sort of the UN mediation team would take it from there and try and do a Syrian-Syrian dialogue. Um, so, so there are negotiations happening around around that, um, and I think you know you could you could read about it too, and we'll see what comes of it. Um, I think one other question was, oh, about um, the partition of uh, population, uh, partition and population transfer, given the ethnic conflict. Um, I, I'm not sure that it's it's so clear. I mean, first of all, no one, no Syrian party to the conflict supports that, and that's first and foremost. Um, neither the regime nor the uh, opposition would support um, any, uh, 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 I mean, th they both support the full and territorial integrity of Syria. Um, and there's a lot of value in that, both in terms of resources and in governance. Uh, the, the ethnic lines are not so clearly drawn in most cases, especially within cities, that it would be easy to do that. Um, and there's, uh, I don't think, sufficient evidence to suggest that doing that would actually prevent the ethnic violence that it would be designed to deter. Um, there are other models in other countries where there have been mass uh, nationwide um, reconciliation and mediation processes and maybe even peacekeeping forces after there's an agreement um, that could help uh, um, uh, with that kind of tension and those kinds of uh, violent acts without partitioning the country. Okay, thanks. Nadir? Yeah, very quickly, I'll take a couple of the questions. Um, should Iran be included in the Geneva process? Um, I can understand the reluctance of um, some players in having Iran come to the table, given the role, the very destructive role um, that Basil just mentioned that Iran is playing in Syria. Um, um, but then you have to stop and ask yourself, if Assad is going to be in Geneva, Iran's role certainly is not worse than Assad's. So then, you know, what's the objection? But I think the bigger question is, you know, can Iran play a constructive role in resolving the Syrian conflict? Can it bring pressure to bear on Assad that could push this conflict in a more positive direction? I just don't see it. Because Iran's view of Syria is that Syria is central to Iran's geostrategic view of the region. It is its key ally in the region. It is the um, access point to Hezbollah. Um, I, I can't see under any scenario where Iran could be brought on board to bring sufficient pressure. It wants the Assad regime there. If that Assad regime is, um, if, it, if it, it's forced to compromise, negotiate, wither away, engage in power sharing, that means Iran's influence in the Middle East diminishes um, by the same amount. So I don't see uh, Iran um, playing a constructive role in the, in, in, in the Geneva process or in, in a peace settlement. It's too heavily invested on the other side. Um, and it wants this regime to stay. So for that reason, I, I can't see anything positive coming out of U Iran's uh, participation in Geneva. With respect to the, the refugee question in, in Jordan and in, um, in Lebanon, I think it's an important one. And ironically, there might be a silver lining here in the sense that if refugees continue to pour out of Syria, they'll start to destabilize the region, and that might force the international community to react and to intervene. I mean, already now reports are that the fourth, lar fourth largest city in Jordan is a, is a, is a Syrian refugee camp. Um, if that continues, it's going to destabilize the region, and perhaps, ironically, that might force the world to, to take a stand. And as for the other question that was mentioned about uh, Morocco um, being a model and bringing the, the, uh, the, the Italians and I think, the, the I French think back, that, I don't yeah, consider yeah. that serious. Yeah, no, no. That was meant. Uh, Michael, you want to? Um, okay, just a few short comments. Um, should Iran be at, at Geneva? I think, of course. Um, all of Syria's neighbors should be at Geneva, but that's obviously not possible. Um, but Iran is a major player. They have behaved very badly, but that's one way that you earn a place at the table. Uh, Assad is going to be at the table, and he, and, and he is even less likely to play a constructive role than the Iranians are. Um, the, the question about Assad and the ICC, I think, is a, is a really interesting and important question. Um, 
if you, if you look at other transitions, like the Chilean transition, it was critical to the peacefulness of the transition to guarantee judicial immunity, immunity from criminal charges to Pinochet. Um, the Spaniard, a Spanish judge tried to turn that around, but, but the, the Chileans made that agreement for the sake of a peaceful transition. And I would think that if, if, it, if it came to that, um, Assad should be guaranteed uh, immunity, despite his awful, the awfulness of his crimes, um, if that produced a, um, if that produced a peaceful uh, transition. Um, there are, uh, there's much to be said for um, uh, international justice, but um, Sometimes peace is more important than justice, and this may be one of those uh, one of those cases. Um, partition. Uh, nobody wants partition, but one way to think about um, the the beginning of an end of the conflict is to think about a humanitarian truce or a ceasefire in place, and a ceasefire in place would effectively be a partition of the country. It, at least a temporary, a short-term partition, while perhaps negotiations uh, went on. But a ceasefire in place seems to me to be a very plausible goal, even if it does mean um, that different forces control different parts of the country for some foreseeable future. Okay. Let me take on both of those issues as well. Um, first, on the question of prosecution, um, I think it's, it's worth pointing out that the reason today that Assad is clinging to power has virtually nothing to do with the fear of prosecution and everything to do with the fear of being slaughtered or having you know, his people being slaughtered, the Alawite to the, the various minority groups who identify with him as, as their protector. Um, that has to be solved first. Um, you know, Assad will never willingly go if he feels that the consequence is just, you know, mass murder of, of the Alawi community. So you do need to have some kind of guarantee of minority rights in some form, whether it's a negotiated solution or a military stalemate or what have you. Um, you know, second, even if there were prosecutions, um, the, it doesn't mean that Assad has to sign the peace deal and go to The Hague. Um, you know, in all likelihood, he would go to Tehran or Moscow, neither of whom are parties to the ICC, both of whom would happily give him refuge. So I think the prospect of actually having Assad in the dock, I think it's remote at this stage. Um, the, I think the Chilean analogy is a bit inapt in that that was, what, now, what, 25 years ago or something? I mean, the world has moved on. <laughs> you know, back in those days, the most you could hope for was truth. Um, justice was an impossibility. And that began to change with the international tribunals for Yugoslavia and Rwanda, and now the ICC. So um, global expectations are different today. And it would no longer be accepted that anybody gets formal amnesty. I mean, I think that's just totally not in the cards. Um, the most anybody could hope for was just to flee and be beyond the reach of, of the limited reach of the ICC. But we're, we're past the stage where people get amnesties. Um, I also would you know, question the idea that amnesty is even a route to peace um, for two reasons. One is the precedential effect. If you, you know, establish a precedent that if you kill viciously enough, the world will be desperate to make peace and you'll get away with it, that becomes an invitation to more brutal killing, um, which is why you do draw the line and don't contemplate amnesties anymore. But second, our experience in how prosecutions or the threats of prosecutions have carried out in conflict situations is that they actually tend to marginalize the extremists. Um, if you look at the experience in, in, in Bosnia and in Yugoslavia, um, in, in Liberia with the Charles Taylor indictment, um, in Uganda with the indictment of large resistance army leaders, um, every time you have an ICC or its equivalent indictment, um, the people who are charged or who are in the, the scope of the prosecutor are so delegitimized that they tend to be marginalized. And it creates political space 
for people who have less blood on their hands and are more interested in peace to step forward. So we've, we've found that you know, even though there's a sort of certain logic to say, well, the dictator would never turn himself into prison, um, in fact, that's not the only choice there. The, the, the threat of prosecution tends to move the dictator, to weaken the dictator, and allow others to come forward um, to, to, to make a deal. Um, on the question of partition, just a brief word, um, you know, if it were so simple as to say, oh, everybody just move a little bit and the killing would be done, you know, that would be a, you know, a serious option we'd have to look at. But what partition really means is that we have you know, so given up on the idea of it being wrong to target civilians that all we can do is try to shuffle civilians according to their, their, their communal identification. Um, and it, it's hard to imagine how you ever stop this kind of mass murder if you've basically endorsed exceptions to it by saying we're just going to split you all apart. I think the answer over the long term has to be you know, enforcing the rules of the Geneva Conventions. No one gets targeted for being a civilian regardless of, of, of their, their sect. And, um, and put the emphasis on that rather than the, you know, the mass dislocation, um, the huge bloodshed that we've seen in, in India and elsewhere um, is, is a consequence of partition. I don't want to lose, and I want to sort of repeat it, what you said about the facts that we have learned that the amnesty option that Pinochet had is not so much on the cards. I do think that we accumulate these possibilities. Now we have some very quick questions. Yes, and perhaps we don't get to answers, but we want to hear the questions. Um, well, the, this panel has outlined very clearly the, 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 the costs of not intervening both geopolitical and internally in Syria. Um, and touched on briefly the costs of, of, of an intervention or what the cost of an intervention would look like, but not so much on what the geopolitical costs of that intervention would look like. My question is, considering sort of the larger costs along with the internal costs, is intervening really, create, uh, is intervening really solving more problems than it is actually creating? Excellent. Your question? Hi. Damien Spears, uh, Columbia Journalism School. I have a question for Mr. Corcor. Uh, Can you be a bit closer to yes. the mic? Mr. Koko, what do you think is the significance of the recent formation of the Islamic Front, uh, made of several, several jihadist groups and major players on the battlefield, for the national coalition, knowing that some of those groups uh, rejected the coalition and other used to recognize it? Thank you. You? Um, the, I'm going to start with a comment followed by a number of questions. The comment is, uh, thank you very much, Sa Sa Saskia, for bringing up Latin America, because that's something that we've forgotten about. And the, my thinking about it is the reason we've forgotten about Latin America is it worked. The, the, the problems there are much less severe than they were 20, 30 years ago. And so my comment is that I think the reason that the dictators are not there anymore is because the U.S. stopped supporting them. <laughs> that they were only there, they were put there by the U.S., the U.S. They did not have any domestic support. I, I grew up in Latin America and I'm sort of with you. Thanks for the okay, comment. Okay, so, so the, the, the questions are, um, um, first of all, is it correct to say, in my personal opinion, that the situation in Latin America is pretty good right now? And um, if so, why is that? If so, um, what can we learn about Middle East, you know, what, what that happened in Latin America? And if it, it is true that the only reason the dictators were there was because they were put there by the U.S., why did the U.S. feel it was okay to give that up? But the Syria space is so different, no? so the geopolitics, yes. So uh, my comment is um, kind of piggybacking on the comment regarding the formation of the Islamic Front two weeks ago. Um, just we were talking about Geneva too and the kind of pessimistic prospects in terms of state actors coming together. But what about all the non-state actors that are playing an extremely large role in the conflict? So I, especially in particular, I wonder what the NCs if they have any ideas, if there was a settlement negotiated between the state actors, um, what is the plan for dealing with groups like ISIS, um, like these uh, Kuwaiti sheikhs who are funding br their own brigades, Ahrar Sham, um, who are not under uh, control of you know, any state actors? Thank you. Hi, Kaylin Hogan, freelance journalist. Um, I wanted to know what role the nonviolent movement and resistance in Syria can still play within such a mil militarized conflict. Thank you. Hi. Um, some newspaper like The Guardian, The Washington Post, uh, WikiLeaks have reported that um, the reason behind the conflict, or one of the reasons, was linked to climate change, um, a, a drought, and also issues revolving around uh, energy. If this is accurate, it might 
help the international community to come up with more specific answers and if well, I wanted to have your opinion on this. Thank you. Hi. Two short questions. One is I'm thinking about Egypt and I think one of the problems that happened in Egypt is in hindsight we see that the elections happened quickly because they had to happen but possibly too quickly and other parties didn't really have time to in build and institutionalize and, and campaign. Now, what would be the scenario, should there by some miracle be an agreement in Geneva to, how long would there be a transitional government, what is a reasonable period of time in which to call elections but not repeat what might have been a mistake in Egypt? And the other short question is, uh, does the coalition, you know, doing the negotiation, and you said, you know, is considered the legitimate representative of the people. On the other hand, we also read that the coalition is, many of them are exiles and don't have such clear control over the armed forces and may have a lot of internal competition. To what extent do they really represent the people? Uh, and what can be done to strengthen that sense of representation? Okay, you added yourself, but very, make it very short, the last question. Yes, Thank you. It, very short. Professor Walser, in particular, has given us a picture of the U.S.'s receding role in Syria. Given that, what can its role in Geneva II possibly be? It goes to the table from a position of fairly extreme weakness and lack of leverage. Thank you. Thank you. All right. A final round of very quick answers. Select your question. You want to start again? Uh, sure. You seem ready. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, many of the questions uh, touch on a, um, a similar theme, which is this uh, the non I, I must say that they have to be short because we are going to be expelled, evicted. <laughs> sure. Uh, the non state States. actors, um, okay, so, so there's a lot of influence by. Um, different countries over some of these groups, even some of the non-state actors. Um, you need to have the buy-in of the international community, including the supporters of the opposition when implementing Geneva. Um, the role of um, uh, the, the opposition being an expatriate or not having control on the ground, um, to some extent the expatriatism is a little bit exaggerated. First of all, I think expatriates um, are a natural phenomenon of a 50-year dictatorship, and at the same time, many of the expatriates are much more recent than, um, than let's say, previous iterations of the opposition. Um, the control on the ground, I mean, it, it all flows through the supporters of the opposition. It, 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 you can think of it as a way um, the regional allies, the political opposition and the armed opposition are all units that can be that can be negotiated that constantly communicate with each other and that can hopefully implement something um, together the role of the uh, nonviolent movement there's an, a great essay in here um, uh, by um, Afrat Jalabi, which I would recommend you read um, it's a very very important role in many ways they voice the 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 very basic fundamental demands of the Syrian people for freedom and democracy uh, and transition, um, that role would need to be amplified. Now, even if you were nonviolent, that didn't stop the regime from arresting, detaining, and killing you in the past. There's over 200,000 political prisoners in Syria. Um, that's another reason that the peaceful opposition uh, has been, has been some quieted, and not to mention it's a very militarized atmosphere. Hopefully, with the advent of Geneva, if something comes of it, it can increase the role of those people. And then finally, on the elections, there is a plan. Uh, I'll be very quick so I don't go too long, but the plan involves um, the transition process would call for six months to a year, depending on which plan you look at. Um, they don't want to rush the elections. They want to make sure there's a system in place. They want to make sure there's a constitution in place. Now, there is a constitution that was adopted by the Syrian people, the Constitution of 1950. That's actually, it's not a dictatorship. It's a parliamentary um, constitution. It has some decent provisions on separation of powers and um, uh, checks and balances and military control that are you know, somewhat outdated. In terms, of, It needs to be updated in some ways, but it's much better than, than what's there now. One of the opposition plans would call for that to be implemented in the interim. Um, and that to be voted on as a constitutional referendum as well. But six months to a year is generally what they were thinking. Then finally, on the climate change and energy, there's some great articles about it. I'm not an expert, um, but th there were some policies that the government took in reaction to some extreme droughts over the past decade. Um, uh, the, the idea that self-sustainability was more important than uh, international exchange. And, um, Part of the result of that, I think, was rural populations um, heading towards the outskirts of urban centers, and there became more poverty and more unrest as a result of that. Um, I'm not sure it's something that could necessarily be used to fix the problem, but hopefully in the next phase of Syrian economy, uh, environmental considerations will be given much more uh, due regard than they were previously. Yeah. 
Okay. Very quickly on the Latin American sort of analogy, I'm not a Latin Americanist, but I think one of the lessons uh, from Latin America that applies to Syria and the broader Arab world is that transitions to democracy matter. They reduce conflict. They give people options. Um, I think that's the broader lesson. That's very much what the Syrian revolution is all about. I think there's lessons to be learned from that perspective. In terms of the roots of the Syrian conflict and, and its relationship to climate change um, and, and drought, let's be crystal clear that the roots of the Syrian conflict lie in the 43 years of Assad family tyranny, first and foremost. But having said that, if you look at the studies that sort of try and lay out why the conflict in Syria evolved in the way that it did, in other words, it didn't start in the urban majors, in urban centers. It was a largely rural phenomenon um, that where the conflict began. That has environmental uh, factors that are involved. Um, there was a drought, there were these sort of, um, the lack of investment in sort of the rural population that led to social discontent that explains why you have a different form of uh, revolution in the case of Syria than you did, for example, in uh, Tunisia or in, uh, in Egypt. Um, there's a lot more that I'd like to sort of respond to, but in the interest of time, I'll, I'll pass it on. Um, I'm not sure I understood the question about Egypt, but I think it's worth reflecting on the fact that the people we called the Facebook kids, who were genuinely liberal, democratic, secular, um, made a revolution, but were not able to win an election. And I don't, I don't know if that's also true in, um, in, in Syria, um, but I would, I would think it's it, very important before you rush to elections to know who's going to win. And if, if you think that anti-democratic forces are likely to win a democratic election, then it makes sense to, to allow some time for trade unionists and, 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 and Democrats and feminists and secularists allow time for them to organize um, and, and to campaign um, so that a long transition to um, democracy is sometimes probably the only possible transition to democracy. Hmm. Ken. I'll just say a quick word on Latin America, but I'll, I'll do it in the context of the justice question that was raised earlier. Um, and that is to say that you know, even you know, 30 plus years after the, the military dictatorships in Latin America, there is a, uh, you know, a deep desire for justice in many of these societies. And in the places where that ultimately has been realized, um, you know, Chile and Argentina foremost, you actually have security forces that are reasonably under the rule of law and reasonably rights respecting. Where it hasn't happened, um, say a place like Guatemala, where you know, there was finally this anomalous prosecution of Rios Montt, but even that was overturned. But other than that, there's been really nothing on the justice front. And you have security forces that continue to be out of control. Even Brazil, which is a vibrant democracy, but has never managed to prosecute anybody for its dirty war, is just now beginning a very modest truth commission. Um, I, I think it's fair to say there's a relationship between that lack of accountability for the security forces and the fact that in Brazil you still have police who have, you know, confrontation, so-called confrontation killings, um, you know, large-scale violence in the prisons. I mean, you continue to have big-time official violence in Brazil because I would submit the security forces were never brought under the rule of law. So, uh, you know, I, be, before you sort of jump to the conclusion and say, oh, Latin America's fine and they didn't have big trials, I think a, a deeper analysis is actually required. Well, thank you very much. This was a great panel. The Syria Syndrome book is still available in the back. And thank you very much to everybody.